Times are challenging right now in Washington, but True Green knows that the grass will get greener. You may be spending more time enjoying your lawn this season than ever before, and True Green can help make your lawn happy, healthy, and weed-free. Call 877-461-0681 or go to truegreen.com slash radio to receive 50% off your spring application. That's 877-461-0681 or go to truegreen.com slash radio. At True Green, we'll take care of your lawn. You take care of you. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing. Guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me for another special episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth. Today, I'm joined by Debbie Fay of Bespeak Presentations to talk about presenting remotely in the age of COVID-19. Debbie Fay is founder and speaker of Bespeak Presentation Solutions, providing high stakes presentation development, public speaking coaching, and presentations training to businesses worldwide. Bespeak's clients include Fiserv, The Hay Group, U.S. Fund for UNICEF, New York City Economic Development Corporation, Tauk World Discovery, Sabra Dipping Products, and many others. An award-winning trainer and teacher with a lifelong involvement in theater, Debbie helps her clients present themselves with confidence, conviction, and clarity, delivering presentations that get heard and get results. Debbie is a sought-after speaker and contributing author to Forbes.com and the Huffington Post. Her book, Nail It, Create and Deliver Presentations That Connect, Compel, and Convince, hailed by Kirkus Reviews as compassionate, positive encouragement for speakers who need to improve their games, is available from Amazon and other book retailers. And in the interest of full disclosure, Debbie is also my sister. Thanks for joining (laughs) me today, Debbie. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Well, this, this is, you know, we are in strange times, and this is, uh, for me, I think a huge topic as people try and figure out how to um, overcome some of the challenges of now suddenly working remotely. You know, it's, it's like a whole new world. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you would talk a bit about how presenting remotely is different from presenting live? Right. Well, first of all, uh, presenting remotely has the the technical challenges, as you can imagine. Um, People get a little nervous, especially the first or second or third time they're doing it because they're not sure they can be heard. They're not sure they can be seen, which means you should get on the, the presentation 15 minutes earlier to make sure everything's working the way you want it to do, just as you would get to the site of a presentation earlier. The key thing that I, that I have deduced is, is really different about presenting remotely versus presenting live is that if you are presenting remotely and you need to use visual aids to accompany you, as most of us do in business presentations, typically you're using PowerPoint or Keynote or Prezi in order to help make your point, in order to, to explain what it is you're talking about, to persuade your audience. When we've done that live, traditionally, 
we may know that our slides aren't terrific. We may know that they're really not an aid for the audience. They're really more of a crutch for us as presenters, but we've let it go because if we're good enough at presenting, we can overcome bad visuals yeah. because we're live. And so the audience can ignore the, the, the screen behind us and just pay attention to us. Or the audience, as you've told me in the past that you do, when you're seeing a presentation that requires a lot of reading, you read the slide first and then pay attention to the speaker. Well, right. if the speaker, yep, if the speaker is just in a little box down at the bottom right hand corner of your screen, or in some cases you can't see the speaker at all, you're just looking at the slides, the speaker really has no. Um, no, well, certainly has no physical role to play because you can't see them. And even if you can see them and they're in the tiny little box in the right hand corner, they're playing a tiny little, little role at the bottom of your screen in the right hand corner. And now your slides have taken center stage. And because of that, it now behooves you to take a big deep breath and and, and recreate slides that actually will be a, a visual aid for your audience and not cue cards for you. Hmm. Wow, that's huge. It's making me know yeah. I have to go back and redo some videos. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yikes. It's okay. I have time. You got time. It's all good. That's right. right. You have lots of time. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> The good, that writing, that's the good news. All the time we spent driving to work, all the time we spent, quite frankly, getting professional clothing on, on days we're going to sit in our office or in our cubicle, all of that time is now ours. And that's time that you really, really, really should be spending on editing your PowerPoint decks or your keynote presentations. You need to look at them and say to yourself, okay, I've known forever that these really weren't optimal, and now I, I, I can't let this go any longer because I can tell you that if you present virtually and your slides are bullets with tons and tons of text, yeah. your audience is absolutely positively going to read it and then go back to what they were doing. And if you have to download the presentation ahead of time, and so they can read it ahead of time, they're not even going to show up. Or if it's mandatory to show up, they're going to have it on their screen so that you think they're there. But they're not going to be there. <laughs> because there's no reason for them to be there because you are superfluous. You are not adding anything to what your slides are telling them. Right. So, so the solution to this is as follows. You need to create slides or visuals if you're in Keynote or Prezi. Your visuals cannot be self-explanatory. Every one of your visuals should have what I call the huh factor. The audience should see the slide and think, huh? They should not be able to understand the slide without you to explain it. And even more than that, or, or, or coupled with that, you should be feeding them this information that they cannot make sense of on their own, one piece at a time. And that's why God invented animation with PowerPoint. So that you can feed it to them oh. one bite at a time so that people don't get overwhelmed, so that we know that they're looking at what we want them to be looking at. So that if you're, so for example, let's say that you now have to um, do training about, uh, about, about um, a website or, or you're a bank, right? And you're gonna be doing training for virtual tellers or your virtual customer support. And these are new people coming on board and they don't know how the screens work and you're going to teach them how these screens work. My advice when you share your screen, rather than sharing a screen actually for education purposes, 
I would do screenshots of the screen and put a circle around the part of the screen that you want them to be looking at so that you know when you're talking about, here's the field where you enter the customer's name. You will put a circle around that field. So it really draws their attention to what you, so you're, and you're in control of that then. That's exactly so. right. Yeah, that's interesting. And by the way, everything that we're talking about holds true when you are delivering a live presentation. You should still be delivering a live presentation using these tips, yeah. but when you're doing it virtually, it, it, it just becomes exponentially more critical that you, you follow these, these rules that I'm talking about or, or use these tools that I'm suggesting. Because if you do that, a couple of things will happen. Number one, you'll have an audience that's riveted. They're not going anywhere because they can't figure out what's on the screen and they need you to explain it to them. So that's right. the first thing. Okay. The second thing is if you, if you build the visuals in a way that you know they're looking at what you are talking about because you're using animation to build it a bite at a time or you're putting circles around things or squares around things that you know you need them to be looking at, now you have an audience that's not getting overwhelmed or confused. And by the way, it, right now in our lives, there's so much uncertainty. There's so much fear that when we do get to present to a group, the last thing we want to do is layer on all that by yeah. confusing them. Right. If we can find a place for an hour or 50 minutes where we can provide education or, or comfort or um, frankly even convince someone that what we're proposing is a good idea for them, yeah. that, that's a gift. Right, because it's clarity in a sea of uncertainty. That's exactly right, that's yeah. exactly right. And there are absolutely people in your audience, Diane, who are in fields where they can help, they can offer assistance right, right now. Right. Exactly. But they need to be able to do it in yeah. a way that is really clear to your point, because there's so much noise going on in all of our heads. So I have a question about that. Given that, sure. is there value in a, a remote presentation being shorter? So, so maybe it's broken up into like three segments so you don't overwhelm somebody or does it not matter? Well, it depends on what it is. You okay. want to be sure you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I, I'm, we know that, that 20 minutes is an ideal attention span. There's been a bunch of research about that. Uh, my presentation guru company, M62, which is it's an international company. It's headquartered in Liverpool, England the owner and CEO, co-owner and CEO of that company, Nikki Take, did research when she was in her 20s about audience retention and attention. That's super interesting. And she found out that 20 to 25 minutes is audience max. However, using things like speaking for 20 minutes and then opening it up for questions or asking questions of your audience you can then string those 20 to 25 minutes together three times for a total max total of 90 minutes, at which point you, you have to stop. There's a hard stop. Mm. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind. I, I truly believe that, that yes, we're going to continue with this uncertainty, but for a lot of us, we're going to, we're going to do what, what scientists have been telling us to do. And we're going to then get, some clear headed space where we're going to be able to think again. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, I'm finding that myself this week, I'm able to really have some uh, a big blocks of time with an ability to think a clear thought. So, it, you know, this happens at all different levels for different people. I have a friend who was thinking clearly a week ago, two weeks ago. So good for him. My point is that I believe increasingly people are going to want to be able to get back to business because it, right. <laughs> if nothing else, it's a distraction from yeah. COVID-19. 
Yeah. So, so there's nothing wrong with little bites of information. People then may want more. So giving them the opportunity to get more would be a good thing as well. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. They can, they can have a choice. They can have these short bites. And then once they've digested the short bite, it's like, you know, when you go to the mall and they're offering you a taste of a Cinnabon, they don't give you a whole Cinnabon because A, it's too much. And B, if you don't like it, that's a waste. Whereas if you have a little bite, maybe you love it and you want to buy more, or maybe you have a little bite and say, you know, that was good, but let me think about it. Right. Then you can come back and have another little bite. And one of the things I really like about this is um, that, that it's thinking about the audience and what they need from the slides, as opposed to what you need to keep you on track or whatever reason you have for creating them the way you currently do. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And by the way, so you bring up such an important point. I'm going to tag on to that. Number one, while it was never excusable, in my humble opinion, to have slides of rows and rows of bullets because yeah. it's audience abuse. Yeah. But, but aside from that, you, right, you thought you needed it because you needed your own speaker notes. Now that you're presenting virtually, there's nothing to stop you from having speaker notes. Because right. <laughs> you can have them at your desk or at your dining room table, wherever, while you're giving this presentation, especially if you're giving a presentation where the audience doesn't need to see you. If you have slides that are dynamic enough, the audience really, I mean, it's a bonus to see you. It really is. People like to see people, especially right now when it's not, right, right when we're all presenting remotely, we need that connection. So I would yes. recommend that even if you're down in a little box in the left hand in the right hand corner that you can be seen. That's really great. That's terrific. You can still have notes. What right. I don't want your listeners to do is create a script for themselves. I am begging your listeners not to create a script because we are not playwrights. We are not screenwriters. We don't know how to write the way we talk. Right. That's interesting. We don't say words like thus, (laughs) typically. (laughs) Right? And and, and honestly, listen to me, I just went, and, 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 that's the way people talk. Yeah. The minute you start reading, you sort of put the audience to sleep. Okay, that's not such a bad idea right now because I can pretty much guarantee people aren't sleeping as well as we did before the pandemic, but that's really not your goal in a presentation. Right. So you want to be dynamic, and and I realize I'm talking nonstop, so forgive me, but the other thing I would like for your listeners to do when they're giving a virtual presentation is to put, if they can, to put their camera or you know your laptop with the camera in it to elevate it so it's at eye level and if you can speak somewhere where you can stand up while you're speaking yeah i can because say when you sit, personally it makes oh, a huge difference in how you present yep mm-hmm. I, I recommend, I do high stakes interviews, interviewing prep, interview coaching. And I always, always tell my clients, A, when they're practicing the interview, they should practice standing up. B, you know, there's remote interviews all the time now, phone interviews. Now they're right. teleconference interviews. They should be standing. Huh. So this is hilarious. I've been practicing more remote presentations that are going to have the video component because up till now when I've done remote presentations I've been doing them for years we didn't use we didn't use video we just used the PowerPoint screen well now we're going to start using video and I figured out this is hilarious that if I put my laptop on my box o wine <laughs> in the kitchen <laughs> I swear to God, <laughs> if I set my laptop on my box of wine, you know, desperate times call for desperate That's measures. That's right. It's at perfect eye level when I'm standing up. Well, how are you going to drink your and wine? 
well, I'm not going to be drinking while I'm giving my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just checking, just making sure. Times are not that desperate. <laughs> We've not gotten to that point yet, I'm happy to say. Thank you. Oh, goodness. God, that'd be hilarious. It would be. Although, although, you know, people are having remote happy hours, which is I know. Kind, of, yeah, kind of a thing. And that's, that's, you know, people need that. So that's great. Yes. But it, it's, and it's got, and where, where, where my box of wine is, is right below a window. And that's another great thing about, if, ideally, oh, if you yeah. can do it. Lighting. Right. It, this is not, I mean. Let me just ask your listeners if they can avoid it. They really do not want to be presenting from their basements because yeah. unless you, you have professional lighting down there, you look like you're presenting in your basement. Right. And it's just not a good look. Yeah. So if you can, if you have a laptop, then you have the luxury of, of moving it anywhere you want in your home. And if you can get somewhere where you have lighting coming in, that's ideal. I, you know, you can go online and YouTube ideal um, virtual presenting, and they'll tell you you might have a side light and a backlight. I'm not sure all that is necessary. But good front lighting makes a big difference. Standing makes a big difference. Because if you're somebody like you and me who use our hands when we're talking, Right. It's easier to use your hands. I mean, I'm using my hands right now and I'm sitting, but it really is easier to do that when you're standing. Exactly. Right. And I think what I've learned over time is that having light behind you isn't necessarily great if you don't have light in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just it, a it weird, gives you a weird. Yeah. Right. And you really want to avoid. So the thing over the years that I've seen, of course, everybody's getting better at it right now. We're all learning in real time. Right. So everybody should keep that in mind. Take a deep breath. But let's face it. Ninety percent of the emails I saw, uh, not emails, I'm sorry, virtual presentations I saw before a couple of months ago, people a lot of the time look like serial killers in their basement. <laughs> I'm serious. So Maybe this, they are. You know, the, God, I hope not. Like looking, looking up at this camera and it's all dark behind them. Yeah. I just think, oh my gosh, like I would just click out of it because it was too, too scary. I just, yeah. you know, my mind was going crazy. So if you can do those simple things, get your, get your camera at eye level, get good lighting in front of you, stand if you can, if you can't, Get yourself in a chair where you can sit on the front half of the chair, not an office chair that's going to allow you to slouch back into it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's and huge. Also, and, what? And, and also one other thing, one, one other little thing. I just saw somebody doing this this morning on like LinkedIn or something. G give yourself a decent distance from the camera. Yeah. Because the camera picks up whatever is closest to it. And so... If you're just a less than a foot away from the camera, suddenly you look like you're all nose. It's distorted. It looks like what is that? What is that thing about where the dog, that commercial where the dog just like looks like he's all nose? It, it, you know, it's like you kind of see people on Ring where it's that really distorted right. view. Right. Yeah. Right. That's just because that's the way the camera is. It's sort of hard though, because what I would, because I've been doing a lot of videos lately, and what I would say is you have to get used to the idea of pressing the start button and then backing up and knowing yep. you're going to have to edit the beginning. You just have to clip Very that out. Very good point. Yeah, because right. otherwise it, you, you're too close. And then you're like, right. it, it's all you in the screen, which is, it's like your head, not you and your body. And it's not good. Right. I, I think though, if you're doing, if you're doing PowerPoint, if you begin, you can do it before everybody gets there where you've shared your screen and it's uh -huh. on PowerPoint and they're seeing you. And if you have a clicker, uh -huh. that's the other thing, right? That's why God invented Amazon. Yes. Um, if, right? if you can get a clicker, then you can change. You're already there. They come on. And then you can click through your slides remotely. You right. know what I'm saying? You can yes. click through your slides using your clicker. The other yes. thing I want to say is this: I do want to say I love it if you're if you're um, if you're taping it. That's a great that is a great tip 
that I hadn't even thought of. It's just edit out the beginning. That's really brilliant. Um, if you can't do that because you're presenting live and people are there live, I think people are going to be understanding about maybe seeing your head for a second while you put yeah. it in uh, screen, uh, screen share or you put it in slide share, sl- um, what is it called? Um, slideshow. I, I don't want your I don't want your listeners stressing out about that. Right. I think that's a really good point. Well, speaking of stressing out, so if people are going to be in front of their camera, um, talk to me some about like like I get this whole you know make sure you're not in your basement, make sure you have lighting and things. Are there other things that they should be doing to make sure they're looking their best? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So first of all, um, and this goes for live presentations as well, right? When, when, when we're on the other side of this and people are presenting in their offices, m- my goal is this is going to up everybody's game. It's going to up, these tips are going to up your presentation game. Yeah. So while some of them are specific that you and I are talking about to presenting remotely, others of these are good presentation practice. So don't let these go when you get back in a conference room live in front of real people in the same building in the same room. So you want to be wearing something that is not distracting. You, for women, do not wear statement jewelry. You just don't want to be doing it. You don't want to be wearing big earrings, big necklaces. Those are fine if you're, this is your statement piece in your office. And everybody loves that about you. But when you are on a, a, a remote presentation and you're giving it to people outside your office, that's not the time when you want people noticing your jewelry and not your message. Hmm. Yeah, Big. so that's, that's, Big. Yeah, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, and the great thing about virtual presenting, if you are going to be seen, is that you can see yourself and you can yeah. see what your hair looks like. You can see what your makeup looks like. I'm really talking about women right now because there are so many opportunities for us to, to get it wrong. For example, we can think that this red lipstick that we've been wearing is the latest thing, and it might be, but if it's too red given the light, it, it could be completely washing us out and looking bizarre. Right. So, hmm. so yeah, so you really want to be sure that you're, you're, less is more when it comes to makeup, when it comes to jewelry, particularly, by the way, if you are giving a presentation where you're not going to have visuals, where it is just going to be you. If you're the president of a company and you're now speaking to your employees, even in a meeting, let's talk about virtual meetings. If it's internal and they know that you're somebody that wears this big jewelry, okay. But mm-hmm. if, if now you're speaking to your, to your clients because you're reassuring them, you're getting on a video meeting with them, and you're not going to use PowerPoint because this is a time when they need to see you. They need to see that you're calm. They need to see that you have a plan going forward. All that stuff, you don't need visuals for that. Right. That's just you. Yeah. And if you're doing that, they should be focused on you. And so you want to be in the most undistracting clothing that you can be in. And, and along those lines, so you're, let's go that way for a minute. You're going to okay. give a presentation to your clients because you want to reassure them about the processes you, processes you put in place for the coming days, weeks, months, it, man or woman. I would recommend that you dress professionally, dress as though you were going to see them on site. Hmm. Okay. What, what do you think? So tell me why, what, what do you think it does for the audience? I think it's reassuring. Okay. Now, once you get into, let's say you're going to have weekly meetings with your clients going forward in weekly meetings, if that's something that you're going to do or weekly updates, which I would call a, still a presentation, as this goes on, you could certainly be, I would gradually bring it down, right? Be in a, in a um, 
in the next step down. So I don't know what industry you're in. If you're in, uh, if you're a landscape architect, you don't wear suits normally. So this isn't a time to ramp it up to a suit. Right. Okay. Right. So maybe you go to your clients in a button down, it's a cotton button down and, and you've got the first two buttons unbuttoned. Two weeks from now, you have your virtual meeting or presentation. You're in a polo shirt. Or you're in, you know, you have a zip up vest on. So absolutely, you can dial it down. That first presentation, you want to be dressed as you would go to a meeting with them on a normal in-person meeting. Okay. That's what I mean. You don't want to be in a t-shirt because you're working from home and they know you're working from home. Yeah. Because you're working. Eventually, you can, right, exactly. Eventually, I really do think that, you know, if your kid pops in and asks a question, that should be okay because other people's kids are going to be popping in asking questions. Yeah. Just the, fir- the first time or the second time, these are your clients, they're nervous. You just want them to know that you've got it under control. I think that is huge. And that's, that's part of that clarity and confidence that when everyone is so uncertain about so many things, um, and especially like employees with now working from home and they're not getting that social interaction and that being mm-hmm. able to see what's going on or over here, or whatever, you feel the energy. It's yep. critically important that um, people are communicate. leaders are communicating calmly and confidently and, it, you know, in a way that, engenders confidence and calm. Yep, yep, yep. And peace of mind. Exactly. Yes. And, and, and what I'm thinking is, you know, there are silver linings in it. There are always mm-hmm. silver linings. And one of them can be that if you were a leader that, that was thinking to yourself, you know, I feel like my team doesn't know me. They only see me as this even as a servant leader the best kind of leader now there are times when servant leaders have to be more authoritarian they have to be the captain of the lifeboat this is one of those times when they need to say look you can count on me i've got this covered i need your help right but i'm on top of this Uh as as i think you're saying to engender peace of mind as the weeks go on i think this could be a real opportunity for leaders to share with their teams a little bit of their home life. They could, everybody could share their pets. They could share photos of them, you know, little videos of themselves. How are you cooking dinner right now if you weren't somebody that was a cook? Right. It, you know, to humanize themselves more with their teams. For so sure. that, right? So that people, and, and also so that a leader says to his team, look, I know, you know, you may be struggling, particularly those of you who are isolated. Let's have a, a, a happy hour on Thursdays at five. Let's have a cooking class right. on Wednesdays at five for those of you who are good at this, because cause I can tell you that I'm the cook in my house and boy, would I like it if somebody could spell me every once in a right. while. There's all kinds of opportunities in this situation where you're in Ohio, I'm in Connecticut, we're really sheltering in place. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it is hard on people. And at the same time, it can be an opportunity. Well, and it is a weird thing for people who are used to working in an office who now suddenly are not. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a client who uh, it's a law firm and during when the RNC was here, their office is in the building right next door to the Westin. So they were told they had to work from home. Like they just totally shut down downtown Cleveland. And so they've been through this before where they had to work okay. from home. And one of the things he said to me, cause I reached out just to make sure, you know, they were okay. And, um, and he, and I said, listen, if, if you, you want me to facilitate like a team thing, I'm happy to do it while you guys are gone. And he said, interestingly, Sometimes these things can bring people closer, even Mm -hmm. though they're physically farther away, which is true. So, but for people who haven't been through this before, you're absolutely right. It it is unsettling on so many levels. 
um, that doing things that are engaging with your team uh, can, can go a long way to improving relationships all the way around. And I created a, just a really quick free course for remote team building be, yeah. for this very reason. And, uh, and these are great ideas that you have. They, they, like I said, you know, you could do a five minute yoga stretch thing. You just, everybody hops on or the leader could keep, could stay on like a Google hangout so that when team yeah. members want to pop in and just get some social interaction with their work and, you know, their, their workmates, they can do it. There's a lot right. of things that, that we can do to shorten the distance, I, I guess is what it's really about for yeah. people who are yeah, to create, us. right. To create connection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Right. So Debbie, I really appreciate yeah. this for the listeners. Is, is there anything we haven't covered that um, you think is important for them to know? I, I think to your point, I think, uh, which is one of my bespeakisms about audience focus is I always say, turn your attention 180 degrees, turn your focus 180 degrees. Right now, as they're going to, be getting opportunities to present virtually and they're putting visuals. The first question they should ask is, do I need virtuals for this particular message? Yeah. If they don't, don't use them. Just get on a, a video conference with yourself as the message delineator. In that case, though, I would say, Sit down, brainstorm what it is you want to say, weed out the stuff that's irrelevant, put it in an organized format, practice it out loud, Huge. and then deliver it. Yeah. Exactly. If you are using visuals, if visuals are important because it's a complicated message, it's a multi-layered message, there are visuals you can use to prove your point, that's great and you should use them keeping in mind that you, the presenter, are there to explain the visual. The visual, no visual should ever be self-explanatory. So yeah. again, they want to think about the audience. They want to create this presentation. They want to make sure they've edited out words that are unnecessary, concepts that are unnecessary. They want to practice it out loud. They could practice it out loud with a fellow team member virtually so that that person experiences it and they experience giving it virtually so by the time they have the real audience in front of them they are more confident and they know that they have got the pieces right and and my final point diane would be that once you've done those things you can be absolutely as effective virtually and for a lot of people more effective because they will have finally put that big piece in place that their visuals are now playing the kind of role that they were supposed to be playing, yeah. which is a synergistic one. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. I really appreciate you sharing this. I think this is going to uh, calm a lot of people down as you know, in, in this, Oh my God, now what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? Uh, but for those people who are not necessarily totally calm and confident with this, will you tell them how they can connect with you? Uh, if they oh, want to get sure. help with this. Sure. So my website is uh, www.bespeakpresentations, plural, dot com. They can get a hold of me at beheard at bespeakpresentations dot com. If they Google uh, Debbie Fay or Google Bespeak Presentations, I will immediately come up. Uh, they can follow me on Twitter at Bespeak. Uh, I have a Facebook page, Bespeak. I have to confess, I don't, I'm not doing enough with that. I should probably do more. The best way to get a hold of me would be probably emailing me uh, at beheard at Bespeak Presentations with an S dot com. Fabulous. 
Okay, guys, you know, we're doing the, these special editions with people who really know their stuff so that you can navigate this strange new world that we are in maybe a little more easily. And uh, reach out to these experts. Get the help that you need. Uh, if you can go it alone, go it alone. I rock on with your bad self. But if you can't, you still need to be doing these things. So reach out to the folks who can help you with this. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. The internet has changed. So should the way you bank. PNC Virtual Wallet for Digital Banking. It's time for a change. Now through March 31st, earn up to $300 when you open and use a select new virtual wallet product. Simply establish a qualifying direct deposit. To learn more, visit a branch or pnc.com slash checking offer. PNC Bank. Make today the day. Virtual Wallet is a registered trademark of the PNC Financial Services Group Incorporated. PNC Bank National Association member FDIC. Times are challenging right now in Washington, but True Green knows that the grass will get greener. You may be spending more time enjoying your lawn this season than ever before. And True Green can help make your lawn happy, healthy, and weed-free. Call 877-461-0681 or go to TrueGreen.com slash radio to receive 50% off your spring application. That's 877-461-0681 or go to TrueGreen.com slash radio. At True Green, we'll take care of your lawn. You take care of you.